Philosophy is written in the grand book, the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze, but the book cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the letters in which it is composed. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts here in England are Matthew Russell and Harriet Gretel. Do 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 da do da do da Galileo. <laughs> it's his birthday today. Galileo's birthday. How about that? Is it? February the 15th, 1564. How old would he be? Quite old. Like oh, 400 yeah. and 457. He'd be doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, he's old. Old, 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 old. It's also Roger Chaffee's the Apollo 1 astronaut, and Leyland D. Melvin's birthdays today as well. Is he the astronaut whose, like, official picture is with his dogs? Oh. Have I got the right astronaut? I think you might. I think Like, the might. best NASA astronaut yes. picture of all time. Yeah, he, he is. He is. God, these dogs are massive. <laughs> <laughs> So much joy in that picture. What a great way to start the day. There's quite a good meme version of it with two Snoop dogs either side of him. Which is quite... <laughs> right, uh, anyway, um, it's also the day that Voyager 1 took its first photograph of the whole solar system. Did you know that? Today is the 14th of Feb. That, I mean, that's just blown my mind, right? Way. I mean, you think about how the image of the pale blue dots pointing back at the Earth and just taking a picture of the Earth was this, like, you know, perspective-shifting event. And then you think about the whole solar system being captured in one photo. Just... What is depressing about it, though, or not depressing or just sort of inspiring about it, is just how pathetically small the Earth is, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, and, and that's just the solar system, which is tiny and pathetic compared to the galaxy, which is tiny and pathetic compared to the size of the supercluster, which is tiny. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, just keep going, going and going and going. And going. <laughs> it's, yeah. I like it, and uh, yeah, Sagan certainly, uh, certainly rinsed it for what it for what it was worth. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things, isn't it, where it kind of makes you feel incredibly small and unimportant at the same time as thinking, wow, there's all of this empty space around us, and yet we're still here. So maybe we are important after all. Yeah. So it's, uh, kind of gets you from both sides doesn't yeah, well, it both thoughts are frightening we're either alone in the universe or we're not <laughs> and they're both equally ridiculous thoughts <laughs> great arthur c clark, clark <laughs> it uh, is, quote it is, right there yeah, arthur c. Clark, exactly <laughs> this week i'm going to invite everyone all the patrons who are, who are on discord to watch um we're all going to have a seven minute terror party this week on thursday because, oh. of course, Perseverance rover is going to be landing. So I tried to work out the times. I believe the live coverage starts at 7.15pm UK time. That's perfect. Yes, yeah, that is. It, yeah, for, I have to say, for the UK, it's actually brilliant. Uh, it's 2.15 Eastern Seaboard time. But yes, yeah, mm -hmm. 7.15, which of course is coordinated universal time as well, UTC, same as GMT. So that's good. Uh, so 7.15, the, the coverage starts, and we should see the landing, get this, at 8.55. So almost bang on 9 o'clock is the seven minutes of terror. Oh, gosh. That's perfect for the UK. That, I mean, <laughs> that's a, prime time TV, yeah. isn't it? Like, literally, oh. And, of course, obviously we have Julio on the show every now and then. Julio is the Argentinian Harriet. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he um, he's working on a... Um, a Spanish version of the podcast potentially because he thought the Spanish speaking version po version of the podcast but NASA are doing the same thing for this uh, perseverance landing the juntos perseveramos or something like that uh, which will be yes the uh, a uh, Spanish version of the show where all the Hispanic NASA professionals are um, are running the show and doing it all in Spanish that's amazing that's so very cool. cool isn't it so uh Mm -hmm. Maybe Julio won't join us on the Discord and we'll be watching that. But I don't know. Yes, this week, Ch <laughs> Chan Wen Chan Wen won the Heavenly Questions, did reach Mars and it was successful. Did you see the video of it getting into orbit? 
Oh, I didn't. So no. It's amazing. Tell me about I'm it. I'm actually quite surprised that the Chinese have shared like lots of videos very, very quickly. Mm. It's like from the spacecraft, and you can see the spacecraft solar panels. But as mm-hmm. it sort of, sort of comes into orbit, I think it's like, wow, wow, it is really cool footage. But I thought we'd concentrate on hope today because mm-hmm. uh, there's a lack of it. <laughs> <laughs> what with lockdown so i thought <laughs> need some hope yeah in our we do lives. need a bit of hope in our lives <laughs> although as discussed last week i'm not a fan of things like hope and perseverance as names they're t- a little bit boring what what would you rather I'd, I'd rather the chinese system like Tian Wen, like it's mm-hmm. like named after lovely poems magpie mm-hmm. bridge being my favorite of the chinese names they're eight aren't mm-hmm. they there's something quite nice about hope but i don't and perseverance, yeah. But they're a bit of, like, you could guess that they were going to be called something like that, couldn't you? Yeah, that's true. There's... Whereas things like, of course, I still love you. <laughs> oh, can you imagine if NASA started doing, like, punny names for their missions? <laughs> Marzy McMars face instead of perseverance <laughs> would have been much better. But no, no. they've gone with they're... hope and perseverance and... Uh... Yeah, keep everyone happy. But hope, well, hope is, <laughs> is of course, uh, the United Arab Emirates... And I have to say, it's a really brilliant story, isn't it? The the United Arab Emirates mm-hmm. thing. Because, yes, 27-minute burn it took. So so as it approached, it has to do this 27-minute burn. Of course, they've never done that before because you can't test thrusters like that that long on Earth in a vacuum. So not done before. Really, the whole mission boils down to that 27-minute burn, which is pretty terrifying. It's not just the UAE, but the Americans have been helping them build this. But get this, the project was only announced six years ago. That's amazing, isn't it? So the project gets announced six years ago, and it's actually in orbit around Mars within six years. That's a pretty rapid turnaround, isn't yeah. it? it? It's extraordinary, and it shows what a country can do when they, they set their minds to a mission like this. It's um... Well, well it, almost everything about the, the United Arab Emirates is, is extraordinary, as in the, the space agency is only seven years old. So in other words, it had only been mm-hmm. going a year at that point. The mm-hmm. average age of the engineers at that point was 27. <laughs> I mean, that's like um, that's like the Apollo program, isn't it? Like, yeah, this... well, yeah, I, get, I, I guess that's it. it. Well, I mean, surely there's a massive lesson in there, isn't there? Mm. That, that like if you want like a major new project that's really new, Mm-hmm. You actually want to just bung a bunch of young people in it because they've got nothing to lose. They don't have reputations and things like that. <laughs> so it's just like just just do it, and of course, and of course, they just go for it. Mm-hmm. And and one of, one of the, I mean, I th- it's such a strange thought for an Arab nation, and it, like from a Western perspective, that eighty percent of the scientists are women. So mm-hmm. women are actively encouraged in the United Arab Emirates, like by legislation to actually go into the sciences and, and, and engineering. But the UAE is almost as young as me, as in it's only been going <laughs> to the, the same time as me. In fact, it's slightly younger than me. So, so I was born just before the UAE was founded. And it was a British protectorate. And then uh, all these kind of little weird trucial states, they're called, these little protectorate states, Mm -hmm. and they all joined forces to become the United Arab Emirates. At the time, it had a population of 200,000. So it's gone in in 50 years, it's gone from like a small town, essentially, and just a bunch of deserts, Mm -hmm. like really just nomadic people in a bunch of deserts, (laughs) to having a spacecraft around Mars. It's amazing, isn't it? And I want to go back to that stat you said about 80% of the science team being women, which is just extraordinary when you think about the context of of where this is coming from. And then in addition, 34% of the entire Mars mission team were are are women on the program. So um, yeah, I think that's a fantastic thing to celebrate in terms of this particular mission and the representation that it's got across the uh, across the program. One of the sort of major players is Her Excellency Sarah Al Amiri, and she's really unbelievably inspirational because she's, I mean, she's only thirty four now, and bear, bear in mind she's been on this mission since the start. Oh, wow! Uh, yeah, she's thirty four. She's the one of the youngest ministers anywhere in the world. So she's the Minister of State for Advanced Sciences. She's the chair of the Space Agency, and she is the project manager for Hope. 
It's a space mission. Wow. Born in Iran, did her computer science degree in 2008 at the American University of Sharjah in the UAE and got her master's there as well while working as the head of space science. (laughs) She was part of the uh, first two satellites that uh, the UAE built, which was Dubai Sat 1 and Dubai Sat 2, that were built in Korea. But, you know, again, she was there as part of that team. She's got a senior role at the Dubai World Trade Center. She was still in her 20s when she was the head of the Emirates Science Council. (laughs) She gave a TED talk at the age of 30 about the Hope Space Mission, which makes her the first United Arab Emirates citizen to do so. This year, she was featured in the Top 100 Women by the BBC, which is a thing that they do every year. Were you in that, Harriet? Did you make it in? (laughs) No, (laughs) Matt. One day, Harriet, one day. But as far as I'm concerned, I think she makes it into the Interplanetary Podcast Top 100 People full stop. Yeah. I mean... Let's 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 put her in. That look hundred yeah, percent deserved, right? Just incredible. It's an amazing achievement, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But but here's I have to say I found this slightly cringy because obviously in in sort of Western countries we sort of we are deeply suspicious, aren't we, of of, of like Arab countries, particularly when it comes to their treatment of women. But she says, you know, she's never ever felt any. She's never ever had any barriers to her success. And the only time she ever noticed notices inequality is when she when she has meetings with international partners, and she suddenly realizes she's the only woman in the room. Interesting. Well, I've seen my fair share of uh, ESA panels, which are all men. So uh, I uh, there's plenty that the rest of the world can do as well. You know. I just thought it was very, very interesting that juxtaposition of of what you would think and what the actual kind of reality is. I, I'm still not a massive fan of the UAE. <laughs> I have to say, mm. it's at least an interesting juxtaposition. Do you know what the main objectives of the Hope Orbiter are? Tell me that. Go on. <laughs> okay, here we go. So it's there's two main objectives, and of course the, the the first one being the main one, which is to is to look at the Martian weather the atmosphere. So it's I think it's the first time they're able to do it in a kind of really holistic way so that they're mm-hmm. able to look at the entire weather system at all places on the planet at, or, uh, at any one time. So you can see what's going on mm-hmm. in the lower atmosphere. So you can look at things like dust storms, clouds, the water vapour and stuff like that. And, and as you're sort of looking at that, there's other instruments that sort of are a bit more zoomed out and look at things like how much the hydrogen and oxygen are escaping into space then connect the two systems together so you've got this the stuff that's going on weather wise on the planet even things down to dust storms Mm -hmm. and see how that affects the atmospheric escape into space wow and that's not really been done before that's the main objective of the mission it is doing proper science that's super useful and it will do this for at least a year, so it will be able to take in seasons as well, so they'll be able to see the seasonal changes and stuff like that. And hopefully it will go on for a lot longer. But the other main objective is this transition from an oil-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. Ooh. This, this so is the UAE strategy more generally, I guess. Yeah. Right? We, we all know that oil is coming to an end, right? We've got to wean ourselves off it big time. Mm-hmm. Or we're or we're all doomed. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. So the yeah UAE strategy is to is to become a knowledge based centres of innovation because one of the things that the UAE have been great at is consuming technology, but they haven't been very good at creating technology. So mm. they're they're shifting now to try and go what what can we do about it, which is why they've given all these young people these these types of projects mm-hmm. so there's this one of the other things that they're building is a great big city out in the desert that is going to be a sort of mars analog oh wow so there's these big science programs that they're giving to very very young people to create these huge projects that basically create a, an incredibly technologically advanced society very very quickly mm-hmm. so it's all it's all part of that and of course they've got the money to do it <laughs> that helps, doesn't it? <laughs> well, they, well, they've got the money now, but I suppose like that—that that money of it will eventually start running out, won't it? When mm-hmm. when when oil becomes cheaper and cheaper and less wanted, right? 
Yeah, and I guess the aim is by the time you get to that point, you've already kick-started all of the technology and the innovation that brings these new industries um, to fruition, right? Just the fact that they've succeeded on getting something in orbit around <laughs> around Mars is actually even probably even more impressive than when India did it. Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, there's not really very many countries who have ever achieved this, right? I mean, I think we're on we're on a handful. You've got the US, you've got I guess Russia, you've got China, India, European, uh, Europe, the Europeans. Oh yeah, I forgot about us. Yeah, um, <laughs> but that's it, but, right? Yeah, like, no, think, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but then there's landing, then there's landing, and only the Americans have achieved that. So Tianwen has got into orbit. So we've got the Chinese in orbit, but they are going to attempt a landing as well. So and that's in a few months, is that right? They're, they're doing yeah. a bit of orbiting first, and yeah. So yeah, so they're not going to be like the Americans. They're just going to go flying straight in with their sky crane, <laughs> which <laughs> which is very impressive. Oh, it has gosh. to be said. It's, I mean, it's, uh... if you think about the accuracy of of like firing a projectile, <laughs> that has to travel for six months and just hit the atmosphere just right. Oh, it's, it's, it... I'm getting stressed just thinking about it now, let alone yeah, I... being on the project, let alone those seven minutes that are coming up later this week. You know, it's it, uh... yeah, it'd be really interesting to know, wouldn't it? What the chances of of curiosity, what they actually put the chances of that whole system working properly? Because if it was something like seventy percent, then if that's the same for perseverance as well, it's like yeah. So every you know every if ten missions go to Mars. Three of them will fail. But it's built by JPL. They got a good rep on these Mars landers. So, uh... Well, they're the only people to do it. They're literally the only people who've managed to do it. And they, and they have had a pretty amazing, solid run at it now. Yeah. So, so definitely looking good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fingers crossed. I'm sure they'll do it. But if they don't, it will just come down to like a single bolt somewhere. It's just not quite, oh. wasn't quite screwed to the right Don't tension. even talk about that until Thursday. Or, 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 a, or a software overflow error. Oh. That's the normal one. Yeah, you know, some sensor just didn't, yeah, was just taking in a bit too much data and then sent the wrong number to a to another sensor and then it crashed. It's kind of bringing back, what was that, your Beagle 2? Beagle right? 2. Well, yeah, and Schiaparelli quite recently as well was yeah. another, was the European one that slammed. Well, yeah. a bit of, Lifo breaking into the surface. Because I was it. just thinking, I mean, that this is like this is the year of Mars, right? Because we've got uh, the UAE, China, US, but we were meant to have ESA heading to yep. Mars this year as well with their own lander, right? And obviously that's been pushed back because of um, delays and I think challenges with the parachute testing. Yes, yeah, so the parachutes. Then the, pa- the, pa- the parachutes had almost scuppered the whole thing, and then when COVID came along, it's like we haven't got a chance of getting this off. No on time. But yeah, parachutes quite important. <laughs> yeah, parachutes are apparently quite important. But and the parachutes for the parachutes for the ESA rover are absolutely enormous. Like oh, enormous, really? yeah, 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 yeah. They're 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 like a different sort of mm. scale. So they have to be like, yeah, they're a little bit unprecedented in size, really. I'm quite surprised. Like it, um, like it'd be interesting to see that kind of um, like level of international cooperation. I'm I'm sure that you know NASA and the US team have been providing guidance and support to, to oh, yeah, NASA no, and others. Oh yeah, definitely, um, definitely. Pa, pa, they, they they did they the NASA sort of reached out and said, you know, we, we, can we help you with the parachutes and they, and they did as in mm. it was like <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's I mean it is the greatest thing about in the the science in the world, particularly space, is there is so much international collaboration, isn't it? Which actually leads on to this next story, because this is like a, this is one that I saw that I, I just couldn't let go. I couldn't let this one go. And that is a swarm of black holes where they were expecting at one big one. They found a, a swarm of them instead. Came up on quite a few of the news channels. So I went, I went directly to the paper, which is, does NGC 6397 contain an intermediate black hole or a more diffuse inner subcluster? 
I didn't even know you could have a subcluster of a black sub, holes. A, a subcluster of black holes, yeah, big time. Wow. Uh, a few astrophotographers will be familiar with NGC 6397 because it's actually it's Coldwell Object 86, apparently. Mm. And I believe I've taken a picture of it because it's actually it's it's ve- it's bright for a globular cluster because globular clusters are right on the sort of outskirts of galaxies of the Milky Way. But this one is actually pretty close. But it's only 7,800 light years away. Mm. Puts it in the top two closest. And they're really good objects to take photos of if you're an astrophotographer. It's not the most spectacular one, though. I have to say, like, there's better globular clusters to take a picture of because this one's it's got this thing called a, a, a collapsed core. Mm. All the stars are so close to each other, they lose their energy. This can, so they have this kinetic loss of energy, mm. and, and therefore the whole the whole inner region so, starts to collapse into a much more compact volume. So they call them collapsed core globular clusters, and this is what this is one of them. So one of about twenty that that are around the Milky Way that have done it, and this one is about thirteen point six billion years old. Wow. We we had a I had a guest on a few months ago who who basically yeah was 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 talking about how globular clusters are really really interesting because of their age and 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 they they have they have like a mysterious role in mm. in the formation of the Milky Way and, and other galaxies and they still haven't quite teased out what that role is so they're incredibly interesting. That's amazing. You, you've just got me thinking about um, when. When we talk about the age of the Milky Way, at what point do you start? When when does it become the Milky Way? Is it like, oh, okay, yeah. we've got a certain number of stars are clumped together, or is there some kind of dynamics that has to take place before you can call it a galaxy? I'm just asking questions here. I don't know. I don't know the answers. <laughs> well, no, I, I I don't. And like Sagittarius A star, for example, did the Milky Way have a supermassive black hole at the centre? at the start or is that something that happens once mm. the galaxy starts to form which comes first the the idea that there's a galaxy there or the idea that there's a supermassive black hole there or are they or do they happen at the same time is it a chicken and egg <laughs> i was i was just I'm thinking chicken and egg yeah yeah, the, the, this thing's really, really interesting. It contains about 400,000 stars. This is the mm. other great thing about globular clusters. They should be really interesting to people who think about life on other planets because you've got 400,000 stars that are 13, you know, in, in a system that's 13.6 billion years old. Mm. So life has had a long time to take hold on on a planet in that system. So if you if you were looking for life... Pointing your radios at globular clusters seems to be like a really good idea, unless there's something about globular clusters that make them totally, you know, <laughs> totally awful for life. <laughs> well, it might, well, well, anyway, to, to, <laughs> we'll find it, out. Yeah, but, but but globular clusters, a they're brilliant to take photos of, mm. and you can and 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 I, they, they are beautiful objects, but. But they are incredibly interesting. But this, anyway. So the the international collaboration here is these these two guys from the uh, Eduardo Vitral and Gary Mamon, who are from the Institute in Paris of uh, Institute of Astronomy in Paris, or the Institute d'astrophysique de Paris. Uh, <laughs> That's what been, I was waiting for. The French yeah, accent. Institute <laughs> d'astrophysique. De Paris, uh, they <laughs> they have they they have been using Hubble. They've been using Hubble to look at the this this cluster. And what scientists have, have what astronomers have thought is that there should be like an intermediate, just like there's a supermassive black hole in the in the centre of galaxies. There should be an intermediate sort of sized black hole mm-hmm. at the centre of these of globular clusters. So they've been using Hubble to look at the proper motion of the stars. So Hubble's able because this thing's close enough, they can actually see movement of the stars using Hubble. They've been using the Gaia Space Telescope that's that sort of adds a level of accuracy to that. And they've been using the Muse spectrograph. So this is the multi-unit spectrographic spectroscopic explorer, Muse, which is part of the very large telescope 
with the European Southern Observatory, right? So that's been mm-hmm. so all three instruments have been used to kind of look really closely at what the hell's going on in this swirling bunch of um, stars right right in the core. So you've got right right in the core, you've got like two percent of the diameter adds up to two, almost up to two percent of the mass of the cluster, so that they know that there's something massive in there. Mm. And so if that was the case, there there should be this this black hole that's one thousand to two thousand times the mass of the sun. So that's not super massive, but it's but it's pretty massive, right? Intermediate. <laughs> so inter- it's intermediate. It's intermediate. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> so. But um, they they while doing this data found that that there's actually stronger evidence that the core is made up of a swarm of objects of white dwarfs neutron stars and stellar mass black holes because the the the, the mass doesn't seem to be point like so i guess i was trying to think in my head what that might look like and it was the, the, i was thinking of if you had like one big metal ball in some that was spinning in water mm-hmm. i guess it would look like from the outside you could tell the difference between that and say a bunch of ball bearings of the same mass all spinning around in the water as well. Mm-hmm. So presumably that's kind of, you know, using clever maths and statistics and stuff that they've managed to eke that out of the data. Uh, that yeah, it's 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 actually made up of a concentration of stellar mass black holes. Wow. This is what Mammon said. He says, our analysis, he's, he's from New York. I, ch- I, I looked this up. Our analysis would not have been possible without having both the Hubble data to constrain the inner regions of the cluster and the Gaia data to constrain the orbital shapes of the outer stars, which in turn indirectly constrain the velocities of foreground and background stars in the inner regions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, fantastic accent well there you yeah. go that's that's your in, in, international collaboration right there right because you've got yep. nasa's hubble you've got ESA's gaia right it's a european e- space yep. agency ESA's gaia ESA and nasa's hubble i like to, i like to point oh. out that hubble's of course a european U- uh, space agency as well and yeah and and the european space observatory as well the the vlt was involved so yeah i mean Amazing. but not just that i mean like all those instruments are used by the international community like it, like everyone is involved aren't they so mm-hmm. what's interesting about this of course is that they may be ligo for example should be able to start seeing uh, mergers of all these black holes so like it will be a massively rich source of Ooh. of black hole mergers because you've got all the like basically a swarm of stellar stellar mass black holes all near each other but so presumably you'll get lots of mergers that's what it is yeah mergers yeah so well basically globular clusters have just become even more interesting and even more of a laboratory for super crazy physics that's awesome imagine if you were honest in a solar system that had developed in a globular cluster Mm mm-hmm and therefore, you were actually really close to quite. A, well, when I say close, you're still obviously light years away, but you're still quite <laughs> close to, like, instead of like Proxima Centauri being your nearest neighbour, you might like have a binary, a binary of stellar mass black holes. Be a little bit unnerving, wouldn't it? Even if it's that. Of course, that might be why there might not be any life in. We might in have answered that clusters. question. Yeah. <laughs> because of course, it's a pretty extreme, extreme place, right? But. Mm. It's had a long time. You'd have thought that one planet in there might might just sort of find a little niche. Well, yeah, it comes back to the um, the Drake equation, right? Had a a lot of stars, a lot of time. Yeah, they've had a lot of time. Yeah, and there's a lot of stars. Yeah, well, I mean that's it, isn't it? But what's the likelihoods of maybe they're just not stable enough? Maybe it's just too chaotic in there. Mm. You want to be in a kind of nice little backwash of of the arm of the Milky Way, just mm-hmm. somewhere really mediocre. <laughs> you might have a chance. <laughs> and even then, it's really difficult. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Europa Clipper, because that was in the news this week. Oh, Matt, my favourite moon, my favourite mission. This is a, this is an exciting one. So Europa Clipper mission, um, this is planning to go on to the Jupiter system and primarily try and get our heads around what on earth is going on. I said, what on Europa is going on? What on on Europa is going on? Yeah. This mission has been planned for for yonks and it's it's got a very interesting history in terms of how it's got to this point. But it finally has a launch date. So 
The mission is planned to be launching in October 2024, which is only in three years' time, you know? I was going to so, say, uh, wow, that, that's closer than I thought, I must admit. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I think when you get a launch date, everything becomes real, doesn't it? You know, you yeah, have a little yeah, bit yeah, more yeah. of a to plan around. Now, the interesting thing about the launch date is um, Europa Clipper's launch has been pretty political. So up until very recently, it was a, a government mandate that the Europa Clipper mission had to use NASA's uh, space launch system rocket, the SLS. Um, and, and the advantage to that is it can get you to Jupiter much quicker. It doesn't need to do these gravitational assists, which means that you can get to um, get to Jupiter in three years, which is much quicker than we could get there otherwise. The challenge is, as I'm sure you, you've, <laughs> we all know, SLS is um, it's a little bit delayed, shall we say. Um, <sighs> uh, sorry. Yeah. So, d- delayed doesn't, yeah. Yeah. De- yeah. So there's a big challenge with, with essentially up until this point, the launch of the Europa Clipper has really been tied to the development and the launch of the SLS, which, which is a real problem because the more the SLS gets delayed, the more this mission gets delayed. And, you know, this is still a huge, you know, probably a billion dollar mission, you know, and the, the last thing you want is it stuck in storage for two years waiting for the SLS rocket to be um, ready to go, right? I mean, yeah, just to clarify, this is con- considered a large strategic science mission so that's in the same bracket as hubble and james webb and all those i mean that that's as big a ticket item as you can get yeah and it is the kind of successor to galileo oh yeah absolutely yeah it's so depressing that it's tied to sls but good news it's not anymore so (laughs) reportedly (laughs) this last week um they're no longer required to use the SLS and so they're starting to look at potential other launch vehicles that they could use as well. So I think they're planning to uh, select the launch vehicle by by the end of this year maybe in terms of where you know what what options they have for launch and so they will be able to include things like the uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy in order to get to Jupiter and how cool would that be to have a, a commercial SpaceX rocket yeah. taking a NASA mission to Jupiter? Like, it, it's oh. it's 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 pretty huge, isn't it? That and and really, there isn't really another player in the game, surely. Like, because presumably Ariane five or Ariane six isn't quite powerful enough. Well, I mean, the other the other big lift, like super big lift that should be coming online is um, New Glenn, right? Blue Origins yeah, rocket, yeah. Um, you know, but Falcon Heavy is actually flown, right? What, so, hap- what happens if it goes up on Starship? I mean, it'd be very roomy. <laughs> It'll have loads of space. Well, well, I mean, well, they could they could they could develop it further because the great thing about because it's not completely defined, is it? The Europa Clipper. So you could have extra, you could have extra bits on it. Add anyway. on some, add on some add extra ons. instruments. Well, no, add on like nanosats and stuff like that because mm. the, if it flies with a bunch of nanosats out there, like you know, like a couple of mich- missions have started to do, haven't they? Fly out with other small sats that sort of help the mission. Well, it was. Um... And- I think it was Mars, the um, the InSight mission where they took two mm. CubeSats, right, that did a flyby yeah. of Mars. And that was just extraordinary. Like the pictures yeah, coming back of this this little CubeSat with Mars in the background next to its solar panels. Like, yeah, that'd be amazing. But Falcon Heavy must be like the, the pretty much the shoe in for this, right? I think. Did you know that there's actually a way of getting Falcon Heavy if you kind of have a kick stage made with a solid rocket, mm. you could do a direct mission as well. But there that you sounds go. a little bit that sounds a little bit risky. Because I think one of the problems with SLS, not only is it not built in time, but I know I remember Eric Berger running a an article a few months ago that that they believe that it would it the vibration would be too much for the satellite as well mm. it's so violent a rocket because it's so powerful right. because of it's like enormous solid rocket boosters the, the europa <laughs> clipper wouldn't survive the the acoustic <laughs> shock of launch but that's the problem that's not so great so good news europa clipper is powering ahead we've got a launch date 
uh, is exciting amazing, yeah. things are going to happen. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll finally get to understand a little bit more about that that um, water ocean underneath the icy shell of Europa. Because right now, scientists believe that there's more water in the oceans of Europa than there is on the surface of the Earth. I mean, just think about that. That's just... If they did even find really sort of simple life, what that means to the Drake equation is quite extraordinary, doesn't it? Because you, you get rid of the Goldilocks zone. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because exactly. It's like, it's like, well, because it's kind of meaningless as long as you're near a source of energy and it doesn't need to be the the solar system's uh, uh, star. Mm-hmm. It could actually be like a, a, yeah, a gas giant could be a, a reasonable source of energy. Yeah. gravitation gravitational or radiation wise mm-hmm. or even in or or even internal kind of uh, nuclear decay energy as well mm-hmm. just keep just keeping everything just warm enough to have a a liquid ocean yeah, yeah. oh my god it's so genius oh. yeah, i mean i mean this this i mean it really is that and um cuz easter also have the jupiter ice icy moons mission as well juice yeah that la- yeah. launches actually before so that's 2022 Oh and wow! Is it that soon? Yes, yeah, and that does. Um, it's not specifically for Europa. It will sort of go. It will do Europa twice. It will do Callisto a couple of times, and mm-hmm. then it gets into orbit around Ganymede. That's that's the juice profile. Mm. And yeah. it's not. And it's not as big a program as the as the Europa Clipper, which is you know that that is. A, f- a super mega flagship mm-hmm. <laughs> spacecraft. So it'd be really interesting. I mean, those two combined will be absolutely amazing because Europa Clipper does orbits of Jupiter, doesn't it? So it, it it does orbits and sort of keeps doing flybys. Yeah, and the, the problem is that where Europa is, the radiation environment is so intense, you can't keep a spacecraft there. So they have to do these elliptical orbits where... They're going around Jupiter, and every now and then, you know, every orbit they'll get very, very close to Europa and do a quick uh, uh, flyby. Yeah, dip in and go. Oh, it's hot, 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 <laughs> and then get, and then get out again. Twenty twenty four. Yeah. But if it's going on a commercial spacecraft, that I worked that out, that we won't actually see it getting there until the twenty thirties, right? Yeah, late 2020s, early 2030s. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a wait. <laughs> if only they could make that kind of that transit time faster. Mm-hmm. No, for well. sure. Because one of the cool things about Ju- uh, Europa is we have had images from the surface of Europa um, from previous missions, right? So Galileo brought back these images, and um, we've there's some really interesting surface features on Europa that we're going to get, well, in maybe 10 years' time, (laughs) a closer look at. Um, But what I love about Europa is some of the features are named after Celtic mythology. So uh, it's just lovely to think that you've got this little icy moon and it's got these little Celtic myth names after it. So I'll do do a couple very quickly. We've got Pwyll Crater, right? So Pwyll was a uh, a king in... uh, uh, Celtic mythology. He was king of a beautiful land containing a magic cauldron of plenty. And what Pwyll is on Europa is this, uh, it, it's a, a crater that's expected to be one of the youngest features on the surface. It's um, about 40 kilometers across and it's got this dark spot in the middle and all these white um, kind of rays coming out of it. Some kind of impact must have happened, right? Um, and it's really interesting because of the colour differentiation compared to the rest of the surface. It looks as if um, kind of fresh ice has been churned up and spread out around this impact crater, um, which is really interesting to see what's been going on there. Um, and then there's, oh, I could talk about Europa all day, Matt, you know this, but it's just bizarre. We've got all these kind of banded regions and one of the banded regions is called Argadnell, which again in Celtic mythology was one of the islands of earthy paradise. See, that that's what they should have called the spacecraft. Arg. Argadnell. Oh, Argadnell. Oh, it's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I like I like the fact that it's an earthly paradise visited by Bran the Blessed. <laughs> I read that as Brian Blessed. The Interplanetary Podcast is alive. It's just such a weird and wonderful world, Europa, you know. We've got these 
chaotic regions where it looks like icebergs have moved and refrozen in different positions. You've got these stretches and cracks which look as if you've had this incredibly dynamic activity going over the whole surface. Um, and, and we're going to be able to get real close to, to see what on earth is actually going on. Can you imagine if while Juice or Europa Clipper are out there, that a large impact actually breaks the surface ice and heats up that area so that you have, like, essentially a big hole full of liquid water that's directly into the ocean. Surely at that point you go, this is an amazing opportunity to get a probe in there because then you wouldn't have to dig through the ice. Yeah, so two things on that. One is we don't know how thick the ice is. It could be anywhere from five to twenty kilometers thick, right? That I mean, that's that's a non-starter, isn't it, for any mission to try and break through? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like if you could think about the problem that the little German mole had on Mars, <laughs> yeah, what with its, its one meter? <laughs> but yeah, exactly. So that's one challenge. To di- well, in fact, they don't even dig that deep in the in the Antarctic, do they? No. I've got some hope for you. So oh, yes. There have been tentative detections of plumes on Europa. So in the same way that the Cassini mission discovered these incredible ice plumes coming out of the south pole of Enceladus, um, Saturn's moon, there have been tentative detections of um, plumes on the surface of Europa in the same way ejecting um, a material into Europa's um, exosphere. So that is one of the things that the Europa Clipper and presumably Juice as well will be able to go and, and do a close inspection of, will we be able to see those plumes? Well, that was one of the things I think they're thinking of doing, isn't it, is is having some nanosats on board the Europa Clipper that, that, that it can deploy into plumes as and when they sort of pop up. Because they wouldn't, well, I, d- I doubt they'd want to fly the Europa Clipper itself, apart from in an extended mission, I suppose, mm. through like plumes of <laughs> plumes of water i don't know but it's like um but yeah so so that i think they're taking that that stuff along with them for, for such a scenario oh gosh matt that, that reminds me we haven't even talked about the um <clears throat> the mars helicopter that's oh on my the, God. the mission that's well you know. yeah we, we're, we're gonna have to leave that for when for, for next week when because i don't know when that's going to attempt flying no, I don't know either. But, but holy let, 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 I, I think we have to do first things first. Let's just get pers- <laughs> let's get Percy get on the floor. Get Percy on the floor, and then worry about <laughs> then worry about the helicopter afterwards. Because yeah, if you talk about it too much, uh, you, you 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 know you're cursing the mission. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But oh yeah, my god, you just there's so many exciting things coming up. You know, we've got all of these missions to Mars. We've got Europa, we've got, um, you know, there's the the Dragonfly mission that's, you know, a little bit yeah. later down the line. But that's another one of these quadcopters on Titan. I mean... Quadcopter just... on Titan is... That that one is... That's mind-blowing. Submarine on Titan would be just amazing nuts. as well. Yeah. I mean, we're but, living in exciting times, aren't we? For... Yeah. Well, if, if they can get their launch vehicles sorted out, <laughs> that'd be good. I mean... <laughs> In, in all seriousness, like if if Starship was going, if then that really does open up quite a different scale of mission to those mm-hmm. kind of planets. We are struggling, it seems, to get Europa Clipper out to, to Jupiter. Yeah, that's a really exciting mission. I'm super, I'm super excited that that essentially they've they've said abandon thinking about SLS as the absolute. You have to use SLS. Mm-hmm. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of getting across the solar system. Mm. There was an article I saw that Eric Berger had done in Ars Technica based on a new NASA report about nuclear propulsion. And it's essentially saying, if we're going to go to Mars, we really need to get nuclear propulsion working, that it's really the only feasible way. And and when you break down some of the numbers, it's like, oh my God, yeah, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. Because if you try to get to Mars with chemical propulsion, you need at least a thousand tons of propellant. Mm. Between a thousand and four thousand tons of propellant, SLS fully fully laden is at a hundred tons of propellant. Ah. And you go, oh what? So just to get the fuel up, you'll have to launch like tens 
of SLSs. So mm. it just that that for me just looks like it's dead in the water, right? So essentially, it's a really exciting time if, for nuclear people into nu- into nuclear propulsion. Two types: nuclear thermal propulsion, which what the Ameri- which is what the Americans were sort of working on over fifty years ago. Mm. Which is, you know, having a nuclear reactor in the, instead of a thrust, instead of a combustion chamber, right? Um, and then there's nuclear electric propulsion, which is, I said, I guess, essentially having lots of ion thrusters that are powered by a nuclear power generator, mm-hmm. and that actually seems less feasible. But I'm going to read you the end of the report because it, yeah, go on, it because it, it kind of pretty much what the report is NEP and NTP that's the two different systems show great potential to facilitate the human exploration of Mars using either system to execute the baseline mission by 2039 however will require an aggressive research and development program such a program would need to begin with NASA making a significant set of architecture and investment decisions in the coming year in particular oh. NASA should develop consistent figures of merit and technical expertise to allow for an objective comparison of the ability of NEP and NTP systems to meet requirements for a 2039 launch of the baseline mission. So that that kind of there's so many things in that in just in that in the fact mm. that, that the Mars mission isn't going to happen from a NASA point of view until 2039 for humans, you know, and that's if they aggressively <laughs> that's if they go on an aggressive timeline from here till then. Mhm. It also sort of puts in doubt the Elon Musk idea of doing it on a starship because it's sort of saying you need so much fuel to do it chemically that, that you know, okay, you've got one way of doing it on a starship, mm. but we don't, we don't actually think it's the right way to do it. Yeah, there were, and, and a couple of weeks ago I mentioned that the British government had, had started talks with uh, Rolls-Royce. Yes, about, we talked about that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, about, about nuclear propulsion. So what would be interesting is if the British can be sort of a major partner in developing what essentially is the next phase of, of solar system. Mm. Um because you know that would cut down the journey time of Europa Clipper and things like that. So it, you think, yeah, the, it, it's kind of the next phase. I think nu- nuclear propulsion will be big. Mm. So don't forget, well, on Thursday we're having a seven minutes of terror. Are you going to join us, Harriet? Oh, that sounds awesome! Count me in. Right, right, right. So Discord Thursday, seven till nine. Let's hope we'll be. Um, <sighs> let's hope we'll be really happy this this time on Thursday about ten o'clock in the evening. It's going to be. I'm not a... going. Oh, what a pity. Oh, uh, God. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Which I hadn't said that. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Um, what are you doing for the rest of the week, Harriet? Um, oh, so I'm, I'm painting, painting a shed this afternoon. Um, nice. S- same old. Same old as every other week in lockdown, isn't it? Just uh, keep plodding along. It's the end of the podcast. Oh, it's been great, Matt. Lovely talking. It's good to have you on board. I love talking about space. Uh, space is quite good, isn't it? <laughs> it's all yeah, right. Yeah, we should, we should yeah. do a podcast about it. Bye, bye, podcast. Bye,